This is a talk that I gave at BBC Introducing Live at Tobacco Dock on the 2nd of November 2019, giving up the day job. And I started by making a disclaimer, saying that this is definitely only one man's opinion. There are many, many experts on this stuff out there, and all of them will have different opinions, and all of those opinions are equally valid. I then went on to ask who everyone was, work out how many of the people in the room were musicians and how many involved in production or promotion or other aspects of music and how many had day jobs. The overwhelming majority, like myself, had day jobs. I started out by recapping what had happened at Introducing Live over the last three days, all the sessions and panels and seminars and workshops and one-to-one advice sessions. I started listing them uh, and we'll pick up the audio from the actual talk in just a moment. But I explained to begin with that there were mixing masterclasses, guitar masterclasses, A&R masterclasses, mentoring sessions and sessions on electronic music and... Electronic music, standout content on a tiny budget, uh, making an album for 500 quid. WTF is music publishing, getting your music on TV, landing a sync deal, finding the right manager, social media masterclasses, the art of artwork, um, music and gaming, getting your live sound right, does my music suck, a favourite one, entrepreneurship, grassroots venues and why they matter, finding a support slot, getting your music on the radio, when do you need a plugger, playlists, streaming, brand partnerships, vocal care for singers, FX and reverb workshops, diversity, joining the dots, Brexit and the music industry, and probably most importantly with regard to that last one, developing mental agility and resilience. So it's great that all those have been available, and it's all stuff that all of us need to know, but it's all to do with process as opposed to outcome. For instance, let's just look at some goals. Who here would like to be played on Daytime Radio 1? Plenty of people. Me. Um, Who here would like to play at Glastonbury? Exactly. So it's worth asking, why do we want these things? Because they come, they go. If you were played on Radio 1 in 2017, That counts for nothing now. If you played Glastonbury, you've still got to pay the bills next morning. So I call this session giving up the day job. Um, Can I just tell you how I gave up my day job in my days as a musician? I was born in 1950. So I was a teenager in the 60s, around the time of the Beatles. At age 16, I fell in love with someone of the wrong sex. I fell in love with another boy at school, and in those days, gay men went to prison for four years. I would rather have died than tell anybody I was in love with this other guy. And so that was the option I chose. I tried to kill myself. I ended up in a therapeutic community for six years, and I arrived in London, age 23, and got an office day job. And at night, I discovered there was such a thing as the gay scene, and I realized at last that I wasn't alone. Now, I wanted to make it in music, and trying to make it in music is like somebody who gets into the car with a view to getting there. So trying to make it in the music industry is a really nebulous goal. Now, I wasn't much of a singer, and I wasn't much of a songwriter back then, but I was good at focus and drive and organizing. So I hooked up with two mates, one of whom was a really good singer, and the other of whom was a really good songwriter. And I was the third party there trying to organize things and make them happen. We had no money. We were there living in bedsits. All we had between us was two acoustic guitars, no equipment, no nothing. But we did have some really good songs written by these two guys. So 
we set about rehearsing vocal harmonies. We had three voices, we did three part vocal harmonies. So we just turned up in folk clubs and you got allowed to play one or two songs at the beginning part of the night and then the main act would come on. But we were rehearsing a whole set because we kept pressing our business card on the managers of all these folk clubs saying, if you ever get a slot, here's the phone number, call us. And sure enough, one Sunday, the headline act at the Battersea Folk Club didn't turn up, he was sick. We got the call from the manager and we were ready and we were in there and we did a headline set all the way through, perfectly rehearsed, beautiful harmonies. And once we'd done a headline for the Battersea Folk Club, we could call up all the other folk clubs, say, we've just done a headline set. And of course, we ended up with a residency of our own at the Troubadour Club in Earl's Court. And then we got dead lucky. Ray Davies of the Kinks came down to the Troubadour when we were playing. And as it happened, somebody had given Ray a load of money to form a record label of his own. So we went and auditioned for Ray. I've still got the studio tape. At one point you hear Ray's voice coming down saying, who's singing the low harmony? And then you hear my voice disappear out of the mix in the, cor in the course of the rest of the demo. We thought we had made it because we'd got signed. That was the thing everybody wanted, was to have a record deal. They gave us 25 quid a week each to live on, and we thought we'd made it. But the first album was produced by Ray, it took him two years to get around to it, and it sold 500 copies worldwide. Didn't get a single play on Radio One. So the band's musical career ground to a halt, but my own career, as an LGBT activist, was in full flow. Information was vanishingly rare. There was no internet. And so I ended up as a volunteer at something called Gay Switchboard. And this was just one telephone in an office that was being manned round the clock by volunteers. Sometimes people would call up and abuse us, and sometimes there'd be silent calls because the person at the other end was so hung up. Anyway, I got involved with that. The other thing is that gay men were still going to prison in the 70s. Two men kissing was an act of gross indecency. So the Gay Liberation Front said, you either have a free and fair society or you don't. You can't ask for liberation for gay men, but say women's places in the home or they're second class citizens, they don't deserve the same pay. And you certainly can't say that people with a different skin color have different rights or don't matter as much as people of another skin color. You had to fight for a free and fair society if you were going to ask for rights for yourself. And uh, when I saw the Sex Pistols at the 100 Club, it dawned on me that the next big thing wasn't going to be an acoustic vocal harmony trio. <laughs> now the great lesson of punk rock was that it didn't matter about being melodic or radio friendly. All that mattered was being truthful and real. And there was no need for a record industry to mediate between you and your audience. You could engage direct with your fans, which they were doing. They weren't signed. And finally, there was a letter in the New Musical Express which said, we want rebel music, street music, music that breaks down people's fear of one another, crisis music, now music, music that knows who the real enemy is, rock against racism. And I signed up for it. That sounded to me like a manifesto for a way of making music with perhaps a bit of added gay. So I left the record company and I formed a new band. The songs were simple, direct, loud, singable choruses, three chords good, two chords better. Information about bands and resources was scarce and vital. So we got a friend with a Xerox machine at his office to run us off newsletters that we gave out at every gig, at every pub, that looked like a kind of underground resistance bulletin. Who was in the band, where we were playing next, funny reviews about past gigs, bits of agit propaganda from me, hilarious stuff from the Dolphinarium News. It had your rights if you are arrested, the address for Rock Against Racism, the address for Spare Rib, the feminist organization. It had the number for Gay Switchboard, and above all, it said, if you want to write to us, we want to hear from you. All letters with the stamped addressed envelope answered. 
so that we had this interaction with the audience and started to build something. And people started coming back and bringing their friends to this. It felt like a gang that they could be part of. And the best thing of all was I got a friend of mine at the Socialist Worker Party to design a logo for us with a fist and Tom Robinson band in stencil letters around the outside of it. And once we had a logo, you could sort of imagine who you were and write the songs to order as part of that. People followed us around because they cared and crucially, they liked the songs. So the music press started writing about us. More people started turning up. And eventually, when EMI Records came to see if they thought we were worth signing, they couldn't get in the door, and they could only see over the heads of the audience, and they could hear the audience singing along. So we got the record deal off that. Uh, and then we got the front cover of The Enemy and Melody Maker in the same week. Radio One started playing our first single, 2468 Motorway. And then I put out a song called Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay, got banned by Radio One, band split acrimoniously in traditional fashion. That was the end of that. But. There was a key difference, and the reason I'm telling you all this is there was a difference between the first band and the second band. With the first band, we did it by the book. You sign to a record label, they're the experts, they know what they're doing, you leave it to them, they'll do the marketing, you make the music, they'll choose the producer, they'll choose the session musicians, they will make the record, they'll wave a magic fairy wand and you will become stars. Didn't happen. But with the second band, we said, the hell with the music industry, we're going direct to the fan base. The music industry can either help us or hinder us, but we're on our way. So all the traditional music business goals that we've been talking about over these three days, the press, the blogs, the radio, the touring, the social media, the streaming, the record sales, the crowdfunding, they're all still part of the how, they're not the what. So what is the what? The actual goal for all of us is the long-term paying audience for our music. That's why you want to play Glastonbury, because it will help with building that long-term paying audience. That's why we want to be on Radio 1. That will expose us to a wider audience who then have a chance of become long-term paying fans. But there are plenty of artists out there who are never played on Radio 1 and never play Glastonbury and who earn a living from week to week and year to year from their music. If you just have 500 people who totally get what you do and totally believe in it to the extent they're willing to lay out over the course of a year 100 quid in CD sales, gig sales, t-shirts, crowdfunding campaigns, then that is 50,000 quid coming in every year and you giving up the day job. The fan base is key. And although it's touted as one of the checkboxes on the standard music biz career path, it is not one of the checkboxes on the way. It is the actual goal that you want. Let me just say again, this is only one man's opinion. And there's lots of people who will tell you, you can't do that DIY shit these days. To me, it seems possible, and I see people who do it. Now, if having the fan base means you can give up the day job, what is the main factor that will help you to build one? Well, number one is artist identity. The industry calls it branding, but let's call it the frame around the picture. If you paint a great picture and you just lean it against a wall in an alley somewhere next to a dustbin, people might walk by and go, that was quite nice. But if you take that picture and you put it in a gallery on a white wall with a gold leaf frame around it and a couple of spotlights and like an, a catalogue for the exhibition, people will come in and go, bloody hell, that's good. You need the right frame around the picture for people to perceive the picture in the right way. The world is full of nice songwriters who pour out their hearts to a guitar or a piano or a laptop but why would anyone pay to hear it? What's in it for them? Because you make pretty tunes? Because you seem like a nice person? Forget it. People buy music like they buy clothes as a badge of identity. If you wear a Sleater Kinney t-shirt or a Koji Radical t-shirt or you get a fat white family tattoo, 
It says something about who you are. If you play Max Richter CDs to your friends at dinner parties, that says something about who you think you are too. People consume music for all kinds of reasons, for sex, rebellion, snobbery, fashion, loneliness, alienation, all kinds of reasons why somebody might buy music. So the key question to ask about your music is who would want it and why? Because nobody is going to spend their last two quid on something tame or ordinary. How will your music win a new audience from scratch on first hearing? How will it propose a community that they're really passionate to join? Focusing your artist identity doesn't involve abandoning your principles. It just de involves defining your principles. So you need to pick an aspect of you that is true and then simplify it, amplify it, and then make music to match. So your name, your clothes, your visuals, your attitude, your style, your lyrics, your artwork, your music, all have to add up to a clear identity. And please be more daring and radical than you think you can possibly get away with. Because what feels comfortable to you walking down the street on a stage will look tiny and small and timid. You don't need to be comfortable on stage. You need to be blown up to cartoon dimensions. You imagine if Elton John walked down the street in his stage clothes, he'd just get laughed at. But on a stage, it looks completely natural that he comes on in a feather boa and sits down at a diamond-encrusted piano. So be daring, be risky, piss people off, take chances, get remembered. Now, this may be controversial, but I think originality isn't strictly essential. Just look at the charts. But conviction absolutely is. So whatever you do, it's got to be very, very real. So am I saying that giving up the day job is just a question of getting a credible image and spending all your time engaging with your fans on social? Are you crazy? Of course not. It's all about songs. After my first band broke through and started playing to 2,000 people a night, I used to have sackfuls of letters in hotel rooms and everyone with a stamped address envelope, I'd write a few lines and write back because I thought it was important to keep the faith with the fan base. And it was the single stupidest thing I did in the entire 40 years of my career. Because they didn't want a letter from me. They wanted great new songs as good as the one they knew. Unless the music you continue to make is great, fans won't pay, and therefore the fan base is pointless, and you have no career. So, if the fan base is the destination, then a shortcut for getting to it is what I call an OMFG song. Not just a good song, not just a great song, a song that people really go, who was that? That's amazing. Every artist needs one of those in order to get to a certain place in their career. I think of it like the space shuttle. It had solid fuel boosters, and it would take off like just try to escape the Earth's gravity. It was so slow that it would like take 10 seconds to get clear of the launch pad. But then as it started to escape the Earth's gravity, it would speed up and then the boosters would fall away. And then once it got up into the stratosphere, this tiny little space shuttle had just tiny little boosters at the back. Poof! Poof! To steer it around. If they wanted to go around the world a second time, they'd just go poof! because they're already up in the stratosphere. That is why you see huge hits still happening with mediocre songs from name artists, because they're already up there, but their original songs that got them off Earth's gravity had to be sodding amazing. And that's what we all need, is a song that will give us that kind of liftoff. Now, that doesn't have to be a massive chart hit. I looked up on the enemy, greatest songs of all time. Number one, Stone Roses, I Am the Resurrection. Only got to number 33 in the charts. It looked like a failure at the time, but it was a landmark song. Public Enemy, Fight the Power. Only got to 29 in the charts. Rage Against the Machine, Killing in the Name, got to 25. You think of it as a number one because it's such a classic song. So 
writing songs is the most important activity any of us will ever do. It's more important than mixing, mentoring, music publishing, meeting managers, or any of the rest of it. And the good news about writing songs is, it's 100% in your control, and it costs nothing. Think of all those other activities, paying for studios or hiring pluggers and stuff. But the thing that actually matters, which is writing the stuff in the first place, is free. And if you can just sing the song into your phone and press stop and play it back, it exists. Once it's written, however shit it is, you can change it. So let's just check again. How many people are songwriters? Okay. Now, how many hours a week do those of you who put your hands up spend writing songs? 20 hours writing songs. Now that is very impressive. But my only question is, what do you do with the other 148? Because there are 168 hours in every week. Most of us who call ourselves songwriters tend to do everything in our lives except write songs. We spend our time rehearsing, chasing airplay, chasing gigs, chasing Facebook likes, not to mention living, shopping, housework, and having a love life. We've all got to live at the same time as being artists. So the key to quality, if we want to write an OMFG song, is quantity. Most of us finish 12 songs and think, oh, that's an album. Maybe we'll finish 20 songs and knock it down to 12 for the album. But in my experience, Successful writers are prolific, really, really prolific. The Beatles at their height were releasing two albums a year and touring. Prince did at least two albums a year. Elton John, two albums a year and toured. And Carole King and Jerry Goffin wrote 20 huge hits in the course of the 1960s. And they used to rock up at the Brill Building at 9 a.m. every Monday. They go into a little room with a tape recorder and a notebook and a piano. And they would write until 5 p.m., stopping only for lunch. And then they'd go home and make dinner. And they'd come back on Tuesday. So they turned up working nine to five hours. But can you imagine the number of crap songs they must have written in that time that didn't make it into the charts. It must have been a phenomenal number of awful songs that they wrote. But they had to write them to get to the good ones. The rule of nine says you've got to write nine bits of crap to get to the tenth thing that's valid. But unless you write the first nine, you never get to the tenth. So for anyone that really wants to challenge themselves with this, let's try and write two crap songs a week for the next year. They can be as rubbish as you like. Once it exists, you can change it. But if you finish two crap songs a week, at the end of a year, you will have a 100 songs to choose from. And when you come back and revisit it nine months later, that thing you wrote desperately in the middle of the night because it was almost the end of the week and you hadn't done the second song, the chances are one of those is going to be bonkers, but also completely original. So uh, let's spend less time on the how and more time on the what. Now the holy grail, giving up the day job, is to earn a living from music. And for that, we need to keep our overheads low. I can give you some examples. There's an artist that we support on my show at Six Music called Shaldo. He is a hip-hop artist who is totally DIY. He has his own record company, his own product brands, goes out and sets up pop-up shops in shopping malls around the UK and sells CDs to customers in person. And he earns a living. It's hard work, but he does it. He's done, I think, over 20,000 records, which puts most record companies to shame. Steve Knightley from Show of Hands is a folk musician. He has a thing called Grow Your Own Gig. Any fan can apply to put on a gig in a church hall anywhere in the country. All they have to do is sell 100 tickets and he will come and play. You rent the church hall for 100 quid, get in the people who pay 12 quid a ticket, and 
He brings in his own PA, sets up the 100 chairs, and plays the gig, his own lighting, everything, earning a living. Laura Kidd from She Makes War has a quarterly subscription club with 160 subscribers, and that's all it takes. 160 people so passionately want to hear her next record that they subscribe in order to get stuff as it's written. She plays gigs online and sells tickets through Bandcamp. People who have children and can't get out to gigs and stuff, it's a brilliant way that they can get to see her perform. If you can't get gigs in the conventional circuit, why not say to a fan, get 30 people into your living room, get them to pay tenner each, and there you can suddenly play Norwich where you couldn't before. House concerts, brilliant way forward. Oh, Hooli and Tito, folk duo, every gig day, they get into their estate car, they throw an electric piano in the back and a box of CDs, they drive to the gig, play the gig, flog a load of CDs, come back home, count the cash. That's them earning a living from music. Martin Stevenson had a band called The Dainties in the 80s, and he just walked away from the record industry. He had enough of its corruption and the way he was treated and ripped off. He went completely solo. He got a friend of his to start booking his gigs. He got really prolific, started turning out huge numbers of albums, and he puts them all off on Bandcamp. And he has a little Jane folding guitar. Have you ever seen those? It's a full, proper playing guitar with a decent pickup in it, and he can just do a gig like that. There's an artist called Slow Meadow. I asked on Twitter, has anyone got any suggestions for how you can actually make music without doing gigs? And Slow Meadow said, ambient artists are probably in a completely different ecosystem from many bands and songwriters. Lots of people said, you can diversify into teaching, you can do DJing, you can do remote sessions, mixing, remixing. And for myself, even while I was working as a recording artist, I also co-wrote two or three songs with Elton John, and the PRS payments kept me going through the darkest years. I did a bit of radio work, I did a bit of teaching, public speaking, journalism. The only thing that is difficult is being in a band, because bands, I'm sorry to say, almost never get to the point where all the members of the band can give up the day job because the pie is being sliced up too finely. If you look back at all the artists who've played on our introducing stage at Glastonbury, you'll just see name after name that you don't recognize. Bands who had their moment in the sun and then imploded because there was no way of keeping the momentum going. Unless something extraordinary happens, the individuals go and do something else that then may be successful based on that experience. With a band, normally you write songs for the band to play, but it's the tail wagging the dog. It's better and works better if you start from the songs and form a band to play the songs. And how does somebody who's a songwriter, they recruit a band to go out and do gigs, pay session fees? The answer comes from Toya Wilcox. Split everything equally. The name artist whose name is being sold gets the same as the bass player. And that way, Toya gets to keep her brand going. But on the day, everyone who contributed to that gig gets paid a fair wage. I'd say, don't do it alone. If you don't like going on Twitter, if you don't like putting yourself out there on YouTube, and lots of musicians don't, consider getting in somebody whose specific job is to keep the whole thing turning over as an integral part of the group. You remember Andrew Ridgely from Wham didn't actually do anything, but it was Wham because Andrew was in it. Bez at Happy Mondays. So there's no reason why you can't form a band with a friend of yours who's good at social media, say, or doing the bookings. Also, do you have one of your fans who does photography as good as your music? You might have somebody who wants to be a backline tech. In 1996, a guitar lead broke, and a guy in the front row of the audience said, oh, I've got a soldering iron in the van, I'll, I'll fix that for you. My gas man. So I said, do you, do you drive? He said, of course I drive, I'm a gas man. So for the next two years, he started taking holidays from his job at British Gas to tour with me and help me with the gigs. He started out as a fan, but he became indispensable. And then he met other people and became indispensable to them. He gave up being a gas man 10 years ago. He now does tour managing for Suzanne Vega. And research the literature 
for options and possibilities. Those of you who are taking notes, here are some book suggestions. Uh, Amanda Palmer has a book called The Art of Asking. Uh, David Burns, Amazing How Music Works. Flying the BBC Introducing Flag, I'd recommend Phil Taggart's book, Slacker's Guide to the Music Industry. Adam Walton from BBC Wales has also made a book called On Making Music, and you can have that for free. He says if you can't afford it, just put zero in the payment page and you can download it. It's an e-book. For a giggle, try the KLF, the manual, how to have a number one hit the easy way. Put it into Google, the KLF, the manual. And then just for the writing side of things, the Frustrated Songwriter's Handbook, a guide on how to break through writer's block. So getting close to the end here, I gave up my day job in 1974, and I had a 28-year career full-time in music. I toured the world, I made 14 albums, and I only ever wrote three OMFG songs in that entire time. But those three songs were enough to fuel an entire career because they gave me that liftoff of the space shuttle. And if I can write three OMFG songs, you certainly can. Why not? Now, life is full of surprises. At a gay switchboard benefit, I fell in love with somebody of the wrong sex at age 36, somebody who turned out to be the love of my life. And I never had another hit record in my life. And then in 2002, the BBC said to me, we will pay you to stop touring and come and work for this new station we have called Six Music. So I finally got to sleep in my own bed, keep regular hours, and watch my kids grow up. I still tour, I still write songs, but I do it because I want to, not because I have to. So, in summary, if you're driven, determined, hardworking, and willing to diversify what you do, then yes, it is possible, even today, to give up the day job and live entirely from music. It can be hugely rewarding to make music as your soul life. Do you hear a but coming? But it can also be grueling, a disheartening slog. It can be bloody horrible. I remember playing 30-year-old hits on an acoustic guitar to 50 people at the Wheat Sheaf in Stoke-on-Trent while they talked all the way through every one of them. Take it from me, that really wasn't much fun and there was no dignity in it. So here's a possibility to consider. A day job that you enjoy and a life that you love can actually set you free from pressure, set you free from compromise and allow you to write those OMFG songs and all that amazing music that you've been sending us and that you and we adore. Thank you. Thank you.